A and KB are big and the same, right? So that's the idea. And of course, are secure from Eve. So that's the problem. So to begin with, let's look at one direction. Okay, so it turns out this problem is solved. So the it's the same setup I just showed, just a little, little bit more detail. But the most important thing here is we have one public message going. Otherwise, everything is the same, X, Y, producing KA, KB, and Z. Now, it turns out the one round capacity looks somewhat similar to the wiretap channel capacity. In fact, if I put this U here beside the Y and beside the Z, it would look like a wiretap channel with input V and output Y and U, and here output Z and U. In fact, that is what's happening. What you do is what Alice does, again, in, in general, you have to add two more two pieces of randomness. So now you'll actually have three pieces of one randomness, one to do randomization in terms of uh, message and random bits, plus a randomization to change x to v, and then more randomization to create a u from v. Now, what is the purpose of this u and v? It's the same as for the wiretap channel. What you're trying to do is create a new channel. What's sophisticated about it is that not only do you replace X with V, but you also replace Y with YU, right? Because I can add here I of U, V, and then I would get I, Y, U, V, and here I can subtract I, U, V, and I would get I, V, Z, U, right? And so, so effectively what you're doing is, what you do is you, s the idea here is you generate both these and then you send U in public. And by sending U in public, you create a YU and a ZU, and by having the V, you just cr creating a new source from X to V. It seems a little counterintuitive to create a U and send that in public, <laughs> but it does help sometimes, okay? And we'll talk a little bit about some examples for this. N and so I think, um, so, so this result appeared in Alsteda and Cheezar's um, work, 1993. And uh, so the idea of UV is create a better source, by right, anyway, I said that. So it, it was in this paper. Now, um, there was a little bit of a, I heard, even when I started at ETH around 1992, there was a little bit of a controversy between Uli Maurer and Alsveda Cheezer, who came up with this first, and so on and so forth, as sometimes happens, you know. Um, but I'll show you in a moment. So what they did is go through the usual random coding arguments, and then, of course, the nice converse tools from Cheezer Kerner, right, the Cheezer identity, uh, and so on, to prove the converse. Uli actually proved this effectively without even doing a random coding proof because what he did, and he actually did this earlier, okay, so it was about a year or two before, he already had this in papers, he had the idea of converting to the source model, to a channel model, and it was a really simple trick which I think is very, very practical and which everyone uses, many people use for physical and clonable functions nowadays. It's exactly the same idea. So what he did is he did the following. He said, well, um, I'll take the X, and instead of generating a key from the X, I will try to transmit a key to Bob. So this is a so-called um, you know, chosen key model rather than a generated key model. So here, um, Alice is taking the liberty to create her own key rather than generating it from X. Okay, so V primed is going to be uniform and independent of everything else. And then what we'll do is we'll switch the model around a little bit. So suppose we have a UV that achieves capacity, like two channels that we know achieve capacity. We're going to generate a new U primed and V primed, where we'll take a random uniform and independent V prime, add it to V, where the size of the alphabet of V primed is just chosen to be the same as the alphabet size of V. Here the alphabet sizes are all limited by the alphabet size of X, both U and V. So we can even, uh, so we generate a r uniform random variable over the alphabet size of at most X, the input into the channel. And now V prime will represent a wiretap codebook because effectively what we're going to do is by sending this U primed in public, we're effectively going to get a wiretap channel with input V primed and outputs Y U primed and Z U primed. Okay, so that's the trick. And then it turns out if you write out the wiretap rate, V primed, U primed, V primed, U primed, it just takes a few steps to show. And that the reason is because this here uh, totally hides V, right? Because it's like a key, it's like a one-time pad. This is hiding V, okay? 
uh, you can show the quality here. So that was Uli's approach. All he did is he, t all he did is he realized I can take cheese our Kerner wiretap channel results, apply it to this new problem, and I get these results. Okay. Now he, what he didn't do, he didn't have the U's and V's. He just worked with X. But I claim, you know, that's not a hard step to see. But it is hard, hard to see that you need another source of randomness to get capacity in general. I, I don't think that's obvious, and that I think is definitely due to Alspeda and Chizar. So they realize that you need a B, you need a U, and um, they also had the converse. Okay, so that's what they contributed here. But I really liked Uli's um, approach for this problem. I think it was very creative. It's much easier if you're a student, you don't haven't don't know much about random coding, you know, it's kind of looks scary at first. It's nice just to take a result and reformulate it. And it leads to different algorithms. Most biometric systems work like this now. You add keys, you know, and, and then send something. Many do, many do. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, so let's do an example. <coughs> one round. So this is the one round capacity. It's interesting you have to optimize over you know, V and U. Uh, here it is, one round. N and let's just do a simple case. So for many interesting problems, you know, the U can be zero, uh, and we choose V to be X, and then you can just see, you just get this IXY minus IXZ as your achievable key, key rate um, if we're coding in this direction. And you again see that the uh, to get positive rate, the channel to Eve must be worse than the channel to Bob. Now here, there is something you can do because I'm allowed two ways. I'm allowed to go both ways. Maybe if I do one round, if I can code from Bob to Alice, I can get this rate, namely mutual information from X to Y. So I just swap X and Y here, right? This is the only thing. And sometimes this can be positive while the other thing is zero, right? And so you choose the best one. So if you look in the quantum key distribution literature, you'll often see this expression. You'll see IXY minus the minimum of IXZ and IYZ as being the rate. You'll often see it that stated because that's they're thinking of coding in one direction. Um, just quickly to run through a few upper bounds, um, Uli um, developed the first ones too. There's also nice results. Um, the first one is uh, the mutual information between X and Y. That one's kind of easy. This one is tricky. Very nice. He had a very nice proof of this in his thesis. Um, this, in fact, this term here gives the capacity in some very interesting cases, namely if X, Y, Z forms a Markov chain or Y, X, Z forms a Markov chain. And in many of the, much of the coding uh, QKD literature, that's indeed the case. You have a Markov chain like this. And that's not too hard to see. Like suppose we have the first thing true here, X, Y, Z forms a Markov chain. Then this thing here just becomes this difference, right? We get equality here. Okay, and for that, we have an upper bound meeting the lower bound. You don't even need U, you don't need V. You get the, uh, um, the, the secret key rate. The maximum secret key rate is given precisely by this quantity or this quantity. Um, and one round communication is good enough. Okay. Now, there's a simple and useful improvement. As far as I know, Alspade and Chizar were the first ones to have this improvement. Um, Different people claim it for themselves, but okay, what can you do? I don't know how, what the true history is, I'd have to talk. But anyway, it, it's quite easy. What you can do to get an outer bound is you just make um, Eve's channel worse, right? So you suppose we make the new Eve be Z tilde rather than Z. Then of course now the secrecy rate must be higher, and so that's all we're doing here. We, we take this bound, which Uli proved, we degrade it, and then we get a new upper bound. Turns out that bound can be better than the original one. There's some cases, uh, there's many cases where that's true. There's some more improvements uh, through the years. So the most uh, rec the, the second most recent one was from 2003 where you add yet another auxiliary random variable, but I don't want to get into this. This is often, Uli like to call this the intrinsic conditional mutual information bound. And he also thought perhaps that's the capacity in one of his papers. He conjectured that, but it turns out not to be the Okay, um, let's now move to multi-round. Okay, so we did one way where capacity is solved. If we can do multi-round discussion, it turns out the capacity is still unknown. And Uli came up with a very nice two-round protocol for his problem. That's also another nice contribution of his thesis. Um, and the two-round protocol is very similar 
to sending this you in public. What you do, Alice and Bob send stuff to each other. This creates a new statistical situation conditioned on some sub-events that may or may not have happened, and then the overall channel gets better. Okay, I'll give you an example of that. And after you create, so you, you're just creating, you're sending stuff to each other to create a new model, and then on that new model you do one round communication. Okay, that's the whole approach. Um, and of course to get, okay, so the, the, this was originally for weak security, for stronger secrecy you add hashing. And, and in the literature this is often um, doing the first step, and I'll do some examples, is often called advantage distillation. The second step is also been called, this coding is called information reconciliation, and the last step is called privacy amplification. So those are lovely words that were uh, invented for um, changing the channel, coding, <laughs> and hashing. Okay, but these sound nicer, of course. So. But and it's interesting, that's what's needed uh, as steps in all these problems. Okay, there's uh, just to quickly flash something at you. I don't want to spend much time on this. So Amin Gohari, the most recent important results, I think foundational results in this topic are already eight years old. So Amin Gohari did his PhD with Venkat Anantharam at Berkeley. He's now at Sharif University. Um, he developed extensions of this one round protocol to multiple rounds. And what he did is he did one round this way, then one round that way, one round that way, and you, you just see these differences in the mutual in information appearing. I, V, Y, given something known, minus I, V, Z, given something known. And then from Bob to Alice, you have to do I, V, X. You have to replace the Y with X, minus I, V, Z. Okay, and you do this multiple times, and he showed that this could improve the one round rate. Turns out, though, it's, uh, and that's something I'm going to claim in a moment, this does not give capacity, uh, because it turns out it's not good enough because it's based on single letter coding, okay? So what we'll see is um, there are further improvements possible with two letter coding, three letter coding, and fundamentally Uli's strategies are two letter strategies, three letter strategies, very simple ones, they're based on repetition coding, okay? And there's b he also developed further upper bounds. So as far as I can tell, his um, thesis, his papers in 2010 are still the state of the art today of this problem, okay? I, except for the protocols. Okay, so let me go, th for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna go through several examples um, um, of uh, what can be done. So let's look at the a classic, what I think uh, is a classic quantum key distribution source. So here's the idea. You have um, Alice can prepare one of two states and one of two polarizations horizontal polarization, plus one or minus one in the horizontal polarization, or plus one, minus one in the vertical polarization. Okay, so she prepares one of two states. She, um, so, so we'll label these with zero horizontal, one horizontal, zero vertical, or one vertical. So there's four possible inputs um, based on the four kinds of quantum bits uh, representations we can have. Bob and Eve measure, they can choose to measure either the horizontal polarization or the vertical polarization, and they do so with probability half. And let's assume Bob has the weaker measurement equipment. Bob measures with probability P. So the way this is represented here, here's Bob's channel, this is Eve's channel. Eve's channel, you'll see, has a noise-free channel if she measures in the same polarization basis as Alice, and it's a fully noisy channel, so crossover probability half if she measures in the wrong polarization. Similarly for Bob, except he has noisy equipment, so he actually measures with some crossover probability, even if he guessed right. Okay, so that's the channel model. It's a lot of binary symmetric channels floating around here. Um, and the noise on the channels is assumed to be st statistically independent. Now note one thing we have here. Here we actually have a Markov chain, namely, Alice, Bob, Eve, right? Because the noise is independent, right? Here we have noise going this way, noise going this way. In fact, this, these are vector linear channels. In fact, we can represent this using additive noise models, namely Y, Bob's output is X. If we represent X as a vector of length two, 0h zero, zero corresponds to 0, 0, 1h corresponds to 0, 1, so the first bit represents the polarization and the second bit represents the 
bit on that polarization. 0v is 1, 0 is 1, v is 1, 1. Then actually this channel can be represented as a vector additive channel. So this is a vector of length 2, and this is a vector of length 2, and the uh, crossover probabilities of the four possibilities of noise, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, just have this distribution for Bob and have this distribution for Alice, right? So z here is equal to x plus, it's a vector actually, if we view it as a vector, x plus ze. And this one here is um, x plus z Bob, and Bob's channel is noisier than Eve's. Okay, so that's the model. Now, if you saw it before, you saw if we have a Markov chain, we know what the capacity is. And what's the natural thing to do here? So there's two directions we could go. We could either code from Alice to Bob, or we can code from Bob to Alice. And it's natural to do it from Bob to Alice, right? Because Bob is further away from Eve. Okay, the, the example I like to give is if you're, um, you know, geographic situation, if you're trying to keep something secret, suppose Eve is here geographically located, uh, Alice here, Bob here, who should, who should transmit the radio signal, Alice or Bob? Of course Bob, because he's further away geographically, right? So then Eve gets an even weaker signal, radio signal, than if Alice sends something that's going out in all directions. But funnily and strangely enough, in the QKD literature, there are many papers that code <laughs> from Alice to Bob. It's a little bit odd. Um, but OK, I think many people have realized that the choice of which way you communicate is quite important. Now, there might be situations where you can only communicate from Alice to Bob, and then the capacity is here 0, right? Because if it's one way, because now it's like having a wiretap channel with um, Bob weaker than Eve, OK? Um, we can compute the mutual information. So the mutual information between Alice and Bob here is I, X, Y. So we get the entropy of Y is just two if all um, inputs have probability of quarter. The entropy of the noise, you just take this distribution and compute its entropy. You get something like this, you get this. Uh, information between Alice and Eve, you get, um, again, two minus the entropy of this, which is three halves, right? That's just a half quarter quarter distribution, so we get a half. Um, and then the information between Bob and Eve, you just compute it. It's the convolu two-dimensional convolution. The probability distribution is the two-dimensional convolution of these vectors, right? Because we get a sum of noi independent noise, so the probability is a convolution here. It's two-dimensional. Uh, and you can compute this quantity. And we can achieve a one-way rate of the mutual information between here and here, right, which is this minus the minimum of the mutual information between here and here and here and here, and of course that's this one here, okay? And that gives the capacity, so there it is. Okay, so this is the capacity of that problem. I think, uh, da -da -dum, here I chose P to be zero point, I'm trying to remember what it was now, point one, oh, uh, what did I choose? Oh no, P is on the x-axis, of course. <laughs> so this is the capacity when P uh, changes to become Point 0.5, then Bob has a completely noisy measurement, and here Bob has a, um, uh, is equivalent to Eve, but you get this rate. Okay, that's the capacity. That's example one. Capacity is known. Let's go to a second example. Uh, I'm not going to do a short break because it'll take too long. <laughs> um, let's do binary erasure channels. Uh, suppose we have the following model. Uh, X is uniform, random variable, binary erasure channel to here with ratio probably p, and let's suppose Eve sees both x and y, both of them, so there's no Markov chain. I want to get rid of this Markov chain to make the problem a bit more interesting. So see, Eve sees both with erasure probability q, and it turns out it's not too hard to compute the one round capacity from Alice to Bob. Um, if you code from Alice to Bob, you get the difference of mutual informations, it's just Alice to Bob is 1 minus P, and then Alice to Eve turns out to be 1 minus Q. The same for um, Alice is 1 minus Q, and so you get um, Q minus P. I've drawn that here. So this is R1. So here's Q. Here's the erasure probability of Eve. If it's 1, then we should get the mutual information, as I mentioned, and that's true. You just get 1 minus P here. So if Q is 1, we just get the mutual information between Alice and Bob. That's this point here. And this curve goes down to zero when Q is P, 
Okay, so that's the maximum one-ray rate from Alice to Bob. Turns out the maximum one-ray rate from Bob to Alice can be larger than this blue curve, but not necessarily. It depends on what the value P is. Okay, but I, and I'm not showing that here. I'm just going to show the one-way capacity from Alice to uh, um, uh, um, Bob. Okay, now here, now let's come up with a simple protocol that gets us capacity, but that needs two rounds, and it's really straightforward. Bob is measuring 0, 1, or erasure, right? He has an erasure channel. He just tells Eve in public which positions were not erased. And now Alice will code only on those positions and get a rate of 1. Okay, so the probability of those positions is 1 minus p, and she codes at a rate of 1. And what is the erasure probability of Eve on those positions? That hasn't changed. It's still q. So it's 1 minus 1 minus q. We get q times 1 minus p. That's it. It's a little protocol. Two rounds, and we get a much higher rate. In fact, you can quickly compute i, x, y given z. Well, that's just the probability I get an erasure times the mutual information between x and y. So that's the capacity. Two rounds is enough. Okay, so it's a simple example to show how rounds help. They help create a new statistical situation where suddenly the channel between Alice and Bob is much better than the channel between Alice and Eve. That's the whole point of these protocols. It's like the U. You're sending something in public, you agree on looking only at some symbols, and that creates a new channel. And what you're trying, the whole goal of designing these protocols called, uh, I always forget the name, Gosh, I have to go back. Advantage distillation. The whole point of these advantage distillation protocols is to come up with methods to send back and forth to create a new statistical situation where the Alice to Bob channel is really good. So you're conditioning on events, right? You're conditioning on events. Um, this is a simpler example of Maurer's results. So he did this for the satellite channel. I think it's much easier to show, but it's not quite as strong yet because I have to fi first figure out how to optimize the U, th this U and V for Bob to Alice. And I think the curve generally, it depends on P, but sometimes I think it'll look like this and uh, it'll stop somewhere here, but I haven't done it yet. That would be a little bit more convincing. But okay, I have to do it yet. <laughs> this is easier to show. Okay, let's quickly let me go over to Uli's channel. So back to the satellite channel. So I'll show you a numerical example of what he did. So it's just the situation, uh, bi uh, bits, random bits from the satellite, binary erasure channel here, binary erasure channel here. Both of these will be very noisy, like crossover probability 0.4, and Eve will have a good channel. So here's just, yeah, here's the model, R plus A1, R plus A2, R plus A3. And let's do an ex uh, random bits have probability half. And let's just assume that this crossover probability is P1, P2, P3. And let's look at Uli's n repetition protocols. He, had, he developed two classes of protocols. Uh, this one's a little bit easier to explain. Uh, what he does is Alice does the following. Alice chooses a coin, C, with probability half, and generate takes um, uh, Maybe I can do a quick example for n equal 2. So let's do the 2 e repetition protocol. So she chooses a coin and sends x1, x2 to, um, to Bob in public. So this is public. Bob gets this and forms c plus x1, x2. And she just adds her outputs. And now, of course, this thing here is z1 plus z2 or z1, z2. And then she does a check to see, is this in 0, 0, and 1, 1 or not? And she signals back, uh, Bob, he signals back to Alice whether this event occurred. And of course, for this event occurred, z1 and z2 must have both been 0 or both been 1, right? But even with public information, you don't know which one it was, 0, 0, or 1, 1. So what's the new channel? Well, it's a binary symmetric channel. What's the new crossover probability? Well, it's not too hard to compute the new crossover probability now. If we have the coin here, 0 to 1, right? It's a channel of Z, C to either 0, 0, and 1, 1. And the crossover probability here is going to be, well, what's the probability of success of getting Z1, Z2, 0, 0, 1, 1? It's 1 minus P squared plus P squared. And what's the direct link? Well, that's 1 minus P squared divided by p squared plus 1 minus p squared, right? 
And the crossover probability is just p squared divided by p squared plus 1 minus p squared. And now what happens if p is really small? Well, the number at the bottom is close to 1, and the number on top has been squared. We have a much better channel conditioned on this event. That's the whole idea. And now you use one round on that. Very straightforward. Okay, that's, and you can do this now for n equal 3, n equal 4, n equal 5, and it turns out if you go let n go to infinity, you can let Alice be as powerful as you want. You, you lose a lot of rate, right? The probability of this happening is going to just scream down um, as you let n increase. Fairly low rate, but you can get positive secret key rate. So it's a really simple protocol that does it has no more complexity than the original problem in terms of information reconciliation coding. The hard part is designing the conditioning, the experiment, right, on what you condition. And that's what you can do with uh, quantum problems, too. So just as a simple numerical example, um, suppose the crossover probability is 0.11. Uh, we use two repetition, then it turns out the new crossover probability is 0 0.015, which is much smaller than 0 0.11, right? You're squaring, basically. Here's an example taken from Maurer's paper. Uh, here he had the uh, crossover probability of Alice and Bob is 0.2. Eve had 0.15. He used a five repetition protocol. You can compute all the mutual information. It's, it, it's now a multi-letter protocol, right? It's a five-letter protocol. And he achieves, here's the rate he achieves with that, 0 0.0029 bits. Very low, but positive, okay? Very low, but it's positive. <coughs> okay, uh, right. Um, now, I was going to go through QKD with multiple rounds, but I think I might skip that because I think it might be too much. So what I wanted to do here is uh, compare what you do with this QKD model and uh, show you some rates, but I think I'm going to show you uh, one rate only. So let me go to the final example. Uh, this final example, and then I'll make some concluding remarks. So this final example is the following channel. It's very simple, similar to what you saw. And what's interesting about this channel is the gap between the upper and lower bounds. So the channel looks as follows. Uh, Bob and Alice have a BSC. Uh, in this example, the crossover probability is very high, 0.4. This is a relatively practical situation for quantum key distribution. Why? Th so there's two ways they, uh, physicists like to generate entangled states. One is individual photons, or the other case is to send many photons. But what they do is they basically send BPSK, and let's suppose this is the not noise cloud. What they do is they put these two BPSK values really close together so that there's a, a big overlap in the noise clouds. And then because you're uncertain whether it's one or the other, it's an entangled quantum state. That's what they do. Okay, and then under some control, if you carefully control this, apparently you can actually make the claim that the uncertainty really does represent an entangled state. Okay, and that's how they develop this. But the crossover probability, it has to be really high to make this work, okay? Otherwise you lose uh, security. Okay, so and here I'm going to take the model where Eve sees Alice's and Bob's measurement both with probability Q. Okay, so Q, for instance, here Q equals 1. She doesn't see it at all. So if, if, if Q is 1, this is just the mutual information um, between... Uh, uh, it's 1 minus the binary entry function of 0.4. That's that number up there, 0 0.03. So it's already quite small. Okay, now what this graph shows is the following. Suppose we use one-way coding, Alice to Bob, and because of the symmetry, it's the same as if we did Bob to Alice. Then we get this red, it might be hard to see, but it's this red curve that comes down. The curve would go straight down here if I used V equals X, but you can add a little bit of V stuff here to make this curve you know, sl become curvy down to zero, but it hits zero right around here. This is Maurer's two repetition protocol rate. This is his three repetition rate. And it also becomes curvy by adding, you know, these on that. Uh, two, three, four repetition, five repetition, six repetition. And you can imagine as you make n bigger and bigger, 
uh, it, it looks like it's going to zero, and it is, but the point where it hits zero always goes further and further out so that if you let n go to infinity, you actually get to this minimal point. This is an upper bound. This is that intrinsic mutual information upper bound I showed. So it's known that actually you can get positive rate at an erasure probability for E beyond this point. But this gap here is, as far as I know, the current situation. And if you look at that, that looks terrible, right? I mean, this is huge. Uh, to me, we're missing something. Either we're missing good protocols. Now, I worked pretty hard, not for too long, but for August or half of August, to try to push these things out. And for this example, I completely failed, uh, which doesn't mean much, but OK. Uh, I tried some other examples there. I was able to improve some of these rates a little bit by instead of using repetition coding, like C, basically here you're doing CC, right? C, C, you can use like a single parity check code or other codes. You can actually get slightly higher rates, but they're so small they're hardly worth talking about. Um, I, I mean, it seems to me that the upper bound is really the thing that needs improvement, right? But I, there's a real gap in understanding. Now, second thing to be said quickly is Look at the n equal 2 protocols. You know, they're pretty darn good. They're getting really big rate boosts, right? So they're good. Um, they're really good to use. And what that tells you is also wiretap channels, some wiretap channels with feedback, with public discussion. You can move way beyond. Like here is the case. Here's kind of the place where the Eve's channel is better than Bob's channel, so you can't communicate anymore. But actually, you can communicate at reasonable rates quite a bit further than that point if you allow feedback. And in fact, the protocols here, the repetition protocols, are just natural for the wiretap channel with feedback. You could just create an open link going back to make it reliable and just do a repetition to create a new channel model between a new wiretap channel model with the n repetitions. And you'll also boost the rates, at least for some problems, reasonably with a simple trick by adding feedback to wiretap channels. So one should really combine these Maurer's repetition protocols with wiretap channels. At least we'll be able to say we Eve's channel can be worse now than Bob's. Um, how much will depend on the model, of course. right? But it'll work. It'll work. And so uh, nobody's done this yet. <laughs> it's, it's really weird to me, because I don't think people have put the two together. You know, you have to, if you see this and you uh, look at the history, it's you really should apply these methods to the wiretap channel. And they're not that hard, right? I mean, it's just <laughs> sending something, doing a protocol like this, and then you have a new channel, and, and then you do the coding. That's the hard part. But you have to know you should at least do this. Okay? So now I gave away. Th this is why I was hesitating giving this talk. I haven't published any of this yet, so. But it, it's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so, and, and there's still, this needs to be improved. This needs to be brought down to here, right? I mean, it, and it needs to go flat here. I mean, these things are so flat, and I, I believe that this is correct. So th this should be really flat, you know, and then come up like this. That's my belief. Now, if I'm wrong, it's even better. If, if you can get close to this, there's really some codes missing that would, that would be a more important result. I mean, that, that would be nice patents you could make if you could shift this up. That would be a really uh, important, I think, contribution. OK, uh, questions? It's all clear? OK, good. Then time for lunch. Thanks for listening. <laughs>